God bless you. We bring you greetings in the most holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to get into the word of God, starting in the book of Isaiah. Amen. Swiftly, I'm uh, going to enter into the message for today. Yes. Isaiah chapter 54, starting at verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Message for today, no weapon. No weapon. Uh, this language, amen, is revealing that as God's people, as the servants of the Lord, uh, we are in battle. We are in a battle, praise God. From the time that we give our life to Jesus Christ, amen, and to the time he returns, we are in a battle, praise God. We're in a battle. And the words weapons, amen, indicates that. Because in a, in a war, there are weapons that are used. So now the word of God tells you that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, but you need to know that uh, when we look at weapons, you need to know what weapons the adversary use. You need to know what his weapons are. Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices. Those that are ignorant are those that subject to, uh, to, to lose the battle. They're subject to come short of God's glory because you don't know his devices. You don't know his weapons. You need to know his weapons. And also you need to know your weapons because not only is it good to know, amen, the uh, weapons that the adversary is using, but you need to know what weapons you have to use against him. Praise God, because this is a battle. You got to know what your weapons are. You got to know what your weapons are. So let's just do a little, uh, uh, Let's say study on basically the weapons of the enemy. We want to look at what he uses, how he uses it. Praise God. What is his uh, approach towards God's people? What will become a weapon to us? Amen. So we're going to start in the book of Job. Go back to, we're going to go into the book of Job and read a couple places in the book of Job to get an understanding of the weapons of the adversary. Let's look at Job 1 and 1. Yes. Job chapter 1. Verse 1, there was a man in the, in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect, upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, I want you to understand, when you give your life to Christ, you start off in perfection because the battle hadn't really started initially. You haven't been hit with temptations and with trials and with tribulations. The devil is always after your perfection, your steadfastness. If you have faith, he wants to destroy that. If you have a deep trust in God, if you have a commitment, a strong devotion, he wants to destroy that. If you have this uh, 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 confidence that God is always with you, he wants to destroy that. If you're confident what God has done in your life, meaning that you know that God has saved you, he have, he have redeemed you, he wants to attack that. And you'll find how strong people start, but somewhere along the line they wing down a little bit. You see them running 100 miles per hour, and at some point the pace slows down because the trial has come, the tribulation has come, and the devil is bringing it with the purpose of removing you from all these qualities that you have. Job was a man full of faith, full of confidence in God. And the devil wanted to attack that. The perfect picture of salvation. What happens when one comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ? The devil wants to attack that. He will attack that. But you got to counter-react those attacks by knowing his weapons and knowing what's going on and what's happening. You know, you could, you could be uh, standing up testifying how God has saved you and set you free and done all these things for you, and then all of a sudden you have a bad dream. The devil visits you in a dream, and the dream was so terrible, you wonder whether you're saved or not because he wanted to attack your confidence. But you don't know his weapons. If you knew his weapons, you could just 
look at that dream and say the devil is a liar and the truth is not in him. If you understand, you just had undergone an attack. You've been attacked. Instead of just thinking you just had a dream, you was under attack. The devil visit your subconscious realm and try to give you an identity crisis. Try to put you in a position where you don't even know who you are because you believe in the dream. But if you know the source that it came from the devil, then you won't receive it. You won't embrace it. Thoughts that the devil may bring to your mind that, amen, will come against who you really are. Because he want to paint a picture of, of someone uh, that you're really not. But if you buy into that, not knowing that you're under attack, then you're going to wonder, why am I thinking like this? What happened, praise God? Why am I feeling like this? You're under attack. You got to be able to come back and fight the devil and say, listen, I am who God said I am. All that God has ordained me to be is who I am. Praise God. The devil is a lie and the truth is not in him. Not only is he a lie, but he's a father of all liars. I rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. I only believe what God say about me. Praise God. And his dreams, because they didn't come from God, you got to tell yourself those are not my dreams because my dreams come from God. Those are not my thoughts because my thoughts come from God. My thoughts are holy. They are true and they are undefiled because my thoughts come from God. Praise God. You know, when you're in a fight, you got you to you talk yourself into victory. Or you find yourself talking yourself out of victory if you believe the devil. But this is weapons we're talking about. And his primary weapons is doubt and unbelief. He want to make you, make you doubt God. He want to get you to a place where you don't believe God. That's where he want to get you to that place. But you got to fight to be steadfast, unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. So you got to, it's, it's, it's something you have to fight and fight for. God revealed to you your identity. He told you who you are in Christ. You got to fight to maintain that. You got to fight to maintain that. Then the devil try to trip you up with a trial or tribulation or temptation. And especially if you fall into temptation, he's going to tell you, see, you're not all that you was cocked up to be. Huh? You're not as saved as you thought you were. But the truth is, you are saved. Even after you fall, you're saved. You just need to repent. You need to be restored, renewed. That's what the Bible said. If any man is overtaken in a fault, let him which is spiritual restore such a one. The one that is spiritual is going to remind him of what God said that he is. Not what you're feeling right now. What God says is what it is. And now we need you to come back to your identity and be the person that God has ordained you to be because everything God ordained in your life is who you are. We need to help you with that. We need to get you back believing God and not believing the devil because it's two speaking to you. The devil speaks to you and God speaks to you. But who are you going to believe? Because if you believe the devil, you're going to start acting out what you believe. That's the problem with that. You're going to start acting out. But you need to know what's going on. This is warfare. And your mind is the battleground. You got to fight tooth and nail to stand on the word of God and declare everything that's been revealed to you since you gave your life to Jesus. See, the devil tried to Work. See, some, some things he does immediately, some things he does with a process. You see people on fire when they first get saved, praise God, uh, you be fighting uh, the saints to, uh, uh, okay, you already sung a song. They're about to sing three more songs because they're so blessed in the Lord. The devil said, you're a little too happy. Let me bring some trials. I bet you they won't get no songs out you after that, praise God. <laughs> 
praise God. Oh, you're so joyful in the Lord, huh? I'm after your joy. Huh? I'm after your joy. Oh, you got such a zeal. You want to go out and tell everybody about Jesus. Uh, uh, tell everybody about Jesus. And see if you take a couple punches if you're going to go tell anybody after that. Huh? You be worried about what's going on in your life, not about the neighbor next door that's lost. So he's working on you. Sometimes he does it gradually. Huh? You was the one who used to run into the hospital and lay hands on everybody to be healed. Now you up in the hospital and you ain't thinking about nobody but yourself. Praise God. But because he hit you and caused you to be on your, on your sick bed doesn't mean that God is not a healer. One time you used to quote the scripture, by his stripes I'm healed. Now you're talking about your prescription. <laughs> what happened? The devil worked on you. And he worked you over till he got you to be on the side he wants you to be on. That is the side of unbelief and doubt. Where you start doubting God. Because he's working on you. It don't happen right away. It didn't happen to Job right away. We're going to see that. Job started off the Bible said Job was a perfect man. One that, shoo, that, one that, that feared God and shoot evil. Praise God. He was full of He was perfect in every sense of the word. He was perfect in faith. He was perfect in confidence. He was perfect in his servitude. You couldn't get Job to speak a word against God before the trial came. But when the trial came, they see how you talk. You couldn't get Job to do anything but bless every day that God gave him. But see what happens once the devil starts throwing punches. Because he didn't realize that he's on the battlefield. When you don't realize that you are a soldier, you're going to find yourself crying and complaining. You're a soldier. You got to soldier up. Okay, you got shot in the foot, but you have to walk on that foot to get on the other side, praise God. Don't ooh and all, just walk on it, praise God. <laughs> Because you're a soldier. You got to endure hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The Bible said when you're persecuted, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Because you're a soldier, praise God. You're a soldier. Hallelujah. You're supposed to be able to take a punch. You got to know you're in the battlefield and you're in the fight. It's going to be some punches. You're not going to be the only one throwing punches. The devil going to throw some punches too. But you got to be able to take a punch to win the fight. You can't be just throwing all the punches. As soon as you get hit, oh, my God, now you out of the race now, praise God. Now you about to put it in reverse because you took a hit. You took a hit. Now you crying. The whole world don't change. Everything don't went wrong. And you complaining. But welcome to the real world where things do go wrong, praise God. Get yourself together because you're a soldier. When the devil come after you, now watch a true soldier. When Paul and Sars was persecuted, not just verbally, but also physically, they was beat to threads with a whip because the devil wanted to beat the Jesus out of them. But instead of moaning and groaning, at midnight they begin to sing songs to God. They had to lick their wounds. Praise God. They had to take it like a soldier. Oh, I'm injured. I'm hurt. Praise God. My body's rocking with pain because their bodies was rocking with pain. They whipped them boys. I mean, they whipped them real good. And then throw them in prison. And all of this happened. Instead of complaining, they sent praises to God to a point that the earth got happy. And the ground began to shake. An earthquake took place. And the prison doors was open. Because God will move after you take a hit if you respond to it in the right way. Sending up praises. Well, just got a bill. Praise God. What I'm going to do about it? I'm going to bless God. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know how I'm going to pay it, but Jesus is going to take care of it. Glory. Hallelujah. Huh? I'm in, a, I'm in, a, I'm in a, a fix right now. Don't know what's going to happen financially, but Jesus knows. Why? Because he's my provider. All that I had, his hand has provided. Great is his faithfulness. He's about to move again for me because my back is against the wall. Those kind of things should, should flow from your mouth. 
Praise God. Start praising God. Praise is saying that you know that the outcome is going to be in your favor because God's going to move for you. Moaning and complaining tells us that you don't believe God's going to do nothing for you. That's what it tells us. Let's go on doing it. Yes. Looking at Job. Yes. Job chapter 3 verse 1. After this open, Job in Job his mouth cursed his day. After he under, had to undergo some attacks by the enemy. After the weapons was formed against him. Job cursed his day. Before this, Job was blessing the day. Every day that God gave him. Job was blessing the day, but now Job is cursing the day. Basically cursing the fact he was ever born. Because he didn't know that he was called to battle. He didn't know that. That every child of God is like a sheep led to the slaughter. But yea, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ. Because in the end, we're going to live off the conquest of the conqueror, which is Christ. The victory has already been given. We're just going to enforce the victory that Christ has already won for us. We're going to speak his word in the situation. And his word tells us that there will be a better day. And, it, and the word tells us that he's going to make a way because the way is already made. We're just waiting for the manifestation. God is about to move. The greater the, the, greater the opposition, the greater the move of God. Well, you're going through financial problems. I mean, God's going to bless you and prosper you because you're in his will. Praise God. Oh, you're going through health issues. Well, God wants, God's going to manifest his healing, but he needs your mouth to set the stage for him to move. Go back to the word of God. Speak the word of God over your body. Speak to your body because it was designed to respond to the words of your mouth. And every time you speak uh, sickness and disease, it's responding to that. But every time you speak health, and every time you speak and say a uh, uh, wholeness to your body, it must respond to that. Book of Proverbs teaches that. A man shall, shall, uh, shall, shall eat from the fruit of his lips. So when you speak, you're feeding your spirit one way or the other. When you speak. So God is waiting for you. To do as he said in his word. Let the redeemed do what? Say so. When the redeemed say so, then God begins to move in the earth. When the redeemed speaks his word over their situation. Whether they're dealing with sickness, disease. Whether they're dealing with poverty. Whether they're dealing with circumstances of life. Tribulations, trials. If they could speak God's word. When you're in your darkest moment, remember the word of God that tells us that light for the righteous shines in darkness. Oh, you're in a dark, dark moment, but light is about to shine. God is about to manifest himself. But you got to know the word to do that. You got to speak his word. Don't go calling up everybody and tell them about what's going on with you. Huh? Because then you get a, a complaining partner. And then you both touch and agree to get the wrong thing. You follow what I'm saying? But get yourself a faith partner that's going to stand on the word with you. Let's speak God's word over this situation. Because no weapon formed against me will prosper. We're going to shut the devil down. We're going to run him out of town, praise God. Uh, we're going to put him out of commission. We're going to render him powerless over my life. In the most holy name of Jesus Christ. Let's come together as faith partners. And shut the devil down. Praise God. Whatever the situation is. You don't got to try to manage it. You can believe God to change it. You follow what I'm saying? So we begin to manage problems. Meaning we accept it. As this going to be the way the story is going to end. But you got to tell yourself the story is not over yet. There's time for God to move. I'm still here. The story is not over. But you finalize it. You just said the story is over. This is the way it's going to end. 
You've already told yourself, you've accepted defeat and say, listen, this is the way the story's going. Oh, no, 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 no. The story's not over yet. There's still time for God to manifest himself. Miracles come through situations. And I'm in a situation, so here come a miracle. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's keep going. Yes. Job chapter 29, verse 5. So I want to show you something. Now, Job that was full of confidence is cursing his day. Is he operating in faith now? He can't be. Huh? Is he operating in, in confidence and assurance that God will deliver? He can't be saying this. He cannot be. Does he, does, is he saying that God is with him at this point? No, he's not. His confidence is gone because the devil has attacked him with doubt and with unbelief. That's why he's cursing his day. Because the devil has made him finalize the situation and make him feel like it's, this is the way the story is going to end. Because once you accept that, you can't help but complain. Why do you want to check out? Why you curse the day you was born? Because you have accepted your condition. That it would never change in your mind. That's how he got. He got to that point because the devil was attacking him. Yes, go ahead. Come back to 29. Yes, 29. When the Almighty was yet with me. I, I tell you what, let, 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 let's, let's uh, just start from verse 1 down to 5. Go ahead. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were as in months past as in the days when God preserved now, me. Now watch this. He's counting his relationship over by saying in months past. Oh, that I was where I was at first. Because right now, I'm not nowhere near that is what he's saying. This walk, this sweet walk he had with God, he's saying it's over. He's saying it's over is what he's saying. This closeness I had with God, that's no more is what he's saying. This relationship that was beyond words, he's saying it's over. Because the devil wanted him to doubt his relationship or his salvation. He's attacking that. He's attacking that. But you got to understand, when he attacks, you got to attack him. When he come after you, you got to come after him. But if you accept it, then you just being attacked. You're not even in a fight at all. You're just being beat up because you ain't throwing no punches. You're being clobbered because you won't even throw a punch. You throw it with the word, praise God, with the word. Yes, go ahead. Keep reading. When his candle shined upon my head and when... Notice he keeps saying past tense. When? When? He's saying it's over. He's washed up. God is finished with him is what he's really saying. That was working on changing his position with God. And this is what happened. He's working on changing your position too, your mindset, your steadfastness, your trust, your hope. You better start swinging. When he show up, you better start swinging. Because the Bible says if you resist him, which means if you fight him, he will flee from you. But if you don't resist the devil, if you just tick the punches, he's going to be walking along beside you. You got to resist them. The word resist in, 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 in the context that was given in the book of James means you got to fight him. You got to put up a fight. And then once you put up a fight, the devil will get in the wind. But you said there, let him keep on planting bad thoughts in your head. And you keep on saying, I don't know why I'm thinking like this. I thought I was. Keep on doing that. Then, you know, you're just taking punches. And still telling the devil he's a lie and the truth is not in him. And I don't believe you. I believe God. Then after you finish rebuking him, just tell him, leave. Get out of here in the name of Jesus Christ. Flee in terror. 
Send them back. Keep reading to it. And when by his light I walk through darkness. All this is past this. When, when, when. It's not happening now in his mind. Yes, go ahead. As I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle. When it was, not is now, but was, yes. When the Almighty was yet with me. When he was with me. So he's thinking that God is no longer with him. When the Almighty was with me. Well, where is God now, Job? If you're saying that. You see what the devil wanted to bring him? A man that was perfect in every sense of the word as far as relationship with God. Be careful of these things. Don't take what you have for granted. Don't relax. Don't relax. You know, if it's like our relationship with God is like riding a bicycle. If you're at a standstill, you're going to fall down. Keep it moving. Keep it in motion. Praise God. Don't take nothing for granted that God has done in your life and spend time with him daily. Don't put them on a shelf and get back to them. Don't try to fit them into your life. Make them your life. He's not a part. He's supposed to be everything. God is not a part of your life. He's supposed to be your life. Everything else is a part. But God is not a part. He's our all in all. He's everything. Everything. That means that he comes first. And everything else I'll put on a shelf for him. But I don't put him on the shelf. I make God what? First. If you fail to do that, the devil's creeping in. He's creeping in. And you're giving place to the devil. And he starts off on the passenger side. And it's sure if he gets on the passenger side, if you let him ride, he's going to what? Drive. He's going to drive, saints. Go after God harder than you ever did before. Don't be singing those sorry songs. Take me back to when I first believed. That means that you don't came short. That's all that means. You don't came short. Take you back. That means you don't lost some steps. <laughs> I want to go further. Not back, praise God. Probably back is where you fell. Praise God. Go further than that. <laughs> praise God. Go ahead, Dwayne. Go ahead. Let's go into the next. Let's go into Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpent. Well, they meaning that they begin to challenge God because of their unbelief and because of the doubt the devil got to Israel as a nation. And then the serpents destroyed them because once they started complaining, the serpents showed up. Once you start complaining against God, and guess what? When you start complaining, demonic spirits show up too. These serpents represent demonic spirits. You're summoning the devil by complaining. And as soon as you start complaining, you end up in demonic act, dealing with demonic activity all around you. Because the devil said, you called, I'm here now. I heard you called. <laughs> You're calling me, huh? You're complaining against God? You're calling on the devil. And he'll let you know, I'll show up. I'll change the whole atmosphere. You'll get all these demonic spirits present. You'll get all this activity that needs not to be in your home because you've been complaining. And the serpents showed up as soon as they complained. Those serpents represent demonic spirits. They show up because you've been complaining. You haven't been praising God. There's only two choices here, praise God or complain. You can't be even in the middle. Either you're praising God for everything or you're complaining about everything. The Bible says in all things give thanks because this is the will of God concerning you in all things. It didn't really didn't say for all things, but in all things. While in the trial, I'm going to praise God in all things. It's the difference between for all things. I'm not, if the house collapsed, I ain't going to praise him that the house collapsed. I will praise him in the situation the house collapsed and saying, my God is able. And my life is more to my life than just this house, this brick and mortar. I didn't lose everything because I have God. So if the house go, if this, if whatever goes material wise and anything in this life that, that I end up losing out on, 
I didn't lose anything at all because my all in all is Jesus. But you say you lost everything. That means that Jesus is not your everything. Your houses, your land, your, your job, and everything else is your everything. You follow what I'm saying? So in all things, in this situation, I'm going to praise God. Not really for the situation, but in the situation. So the Bible said, in all things, give thanks. No matter what the situation is, give them praise. Give them praise. You could just lost somebody who's close and dear to you. You ain't thanking God for the loss. You're thanking God that he's keeping you while you're going through this process of the loss. And that still I have peace, though the one I love so dearly is going on. Have left the scene now. Still going to praise God. In all things. Not for all things. Don't get it wrong. But in all things. Give thanks. So it's not a situation I'm facing that I can't give God thanks in the situation. Praise God. Let's go on. Neither murmured yea, and some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Yeah. Now all these things happen unto them, th them for examples, and they are written for our domination upon See, whom? See, for our admiration is written, so it's written for your learning, for your teaching. So you don't do the same thing. Read this whole Tim's chapter, because many mistakes they made. That God is telling you, please don't make these same mistakes. Read that Tim's chapter. Of First Corinthians, the whole chapter. We don't got time to cover it all, but read the whole chapter. God is underlining things that Israel did as mistakes that you don't have to make. But the reason why the mistakes came, because the devil was trying to change their position with God. And the reason why they complained, because the devil hit them with unbelief and with doubt, which is his weapons. But don't let doubt or unbelief prosper. Put it to rest with faith and say, I'm going to believe God where the devil's trying to get me to doubt God. I'm going to believe God where he's trying to get me to a place where I don't, but I get into a place of unbelief. No, I'm going to believe God instead of being in doubt or unbelief. Because his weapons can't prosper with me. Hallelujah. Let's go on to Hebrews about to close here. Three Hebrews 3 and 12. Yes. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing He's from the living God. He's saying that for a reason God. because when, he first, when, it, to end it, when the gospel was first introduced to the Hebrew people, they had a big problem with the transition between walking with Christ and giving up the rituals and ceremonies that they found under Judaism. And some of them did turn back. Because they loved that more than hearing the message of Christ. So Paul is saying to them out of this historical fact that happened with them, many of them did turn back. Paul said, if there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. So he's telling them that if they have an evil heart of unbelief, there's something going on. The process hasn't begun or it hasn't finalized with you. That means you're not really born again. Because if you have an evil heart, you certainly don't have a new heart. You follow what I'm saying? But if there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God. Because unbelief is going to send you away from God, not towards him. The devil is hitting you with a weapon. Don't let it prosper, is what he said. Don't let it prosper. Let's skip to, uh, let's go, it's going down to the next verse here. Verse 18, yes. and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So it's going back to unbelief. Yes, go ahead. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So what stopped Israel from being what God had ordained them to be and what God had purposed for them to be? It was a weapon formed against them called unbelief. Their number one killer for the nation was truly unbelief. That was the number one killer. That's what stopped Israel from reaching the promised land. We're done. God bless you. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is unto you 
and unto your children, and unto those that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. God bless you.